So could you give us your name and age, please? Hi, Eric. Yes, I'm Ed Thompson, uh, and I'm uh, now 79 years young, and I've been in the mining business now for, uh, I guess, close to 60 years. I was born in the Muskoka area, uh, which is now the holiday playground for Toronto, but uh, in the middle of the Depression, 1936, it, uh, it was a very tough uh, place to live and grow up. Uh, my father was uh, just a general laborer working in lumber mills and uh, in the bush, and, and uh, in the middle of the Depression, he, uh, he would tell us that he uh, made a dollar a day by cutting wood. He barely survived. So how did you become interested in, uh, in mining and engineering? Well, it was mainly, as a lot of things in life, uh, sort of by accident. Uh, I uh, had to do a lot of jobs as a young person because we were, didn't have any money. So I started working when I was uh, 12 or 13 and uh, working in lumber mills. And uh, I uh, got river driving uh, when I was 17 or 18 up in the Nipigon River in uh, northern Ontario. And the last year I was up there, uh, there was a, a mining boom going on for metal called lithium. In '55, it was going to be the wonder metal, and there were several deposits uh, on the uh, around Lake Nipigon, and the supervisors were uh, running around with pieces of spodumene in their hand, which is a lithium ore, and staking claims and uh, general excitement. I had not decided what I was going to do. Uh, there was essentially no guidance in those days, and. Uh, in uh, high school and there was none. My mother had died when I was seven and my father was uh, uh, really uneducated, could not really read or write. So I was essentially on my own, but uh, in the last year of high school, I uh, somebody suggested I fill out an application form for University of Toronto Engineering because I did well in uh, mathematics. So I had filled in this form for engineering and uh, no idea how I was going to finance it because I just lived uh, by my own wits. Uh, and uh, about the time uh, towards the end of the summer, I got a letter from U of T saying I, I had a, a scholarship or a bursary that would uh, help for the first year. And I was admitted into the general engineering course. And I initially thought, well, I'd take civil engineering. Was, I didn't really know anything about the various engineering branches. And uh, with this mining rush at the last minute, I switched over to uh, geological engineering uh, with the idea the first year engineering was common at the University of Toronto, so uh, you would have a chance to s switch later on if I didn't want to stay in geological engineering. But uh, I made a few friends uh, that year, including Norm Keeble was in my class, uh, was a well-known mining personality, and uh, a few other people. and. Uh, we joined a similar fraternity, and uh, I, uh, I stayed in geological engineering just by sort of a fluke of uh, luck. <laughs> so, so you'd started out working in the woods. Did, did you enjoy it? Was that one of the reasons why you uh, went into went into uh, geological engineering? Yeah, at that time when I, you know, when you're in your late teens or so, uh, I uh, I had no idea what uh, office jobs were. I had always worked outside and and thought that uh, I would like to have a more of an outdoor life than a, an office life. And, uh, and uh, certainly in geology, you get lots of uh, <laughs> time in the outdoors. <laughs> had, you, had you come to Toronto before, before you started at, uh, in engineering at U of T? I had been here a few times. My mother originally was from Toronto. She had met my father in Muskoka and moved there when they were married in 1935. So I had a number of relatives in Toronto, and uh, I would come down on the train maybe once a year or so to uh, visit them. But uh, I had uh, really no experience in Toronto and was completely naive. And uh, luckily, I had a friend in Bracebridge uh, High School that was more tuned in than I was. And uh, he uh, was entering the dentistry course and had arranged a place for us to stay the first year in uh, in Toronto and uh, 
after a week or so, we gradually uh, figured out the landscape and fit it in. Can you tell us about your experiences in the uh, in the uh, mining engineering courses at the uh, University of Toronto? I was generally disappointed, uh, I guess, in the courses at the University of Toronto. They uh, there's an old saying in the teaching profession, those that can do and those that can't teach. And there was only a couple of professors that really uh, got us enthused and we enjoyed going to their classes. Uh, can we take a break? Absolutely, yeah. So, yeah, the, uh, it, it, the, the, some of the classes were very large and uh, uh, I thought some of the teaching uh, was sort of outdated. They had uh, more people that had had a career, but uh, they weren't up to date with the, uh, with the modern methods and, and uh, evaluation techniques. And after I graduated, uh, essentially I had to learn the basics of economics and tax planning and all of the uh, numbers that you need to do evaluations. You had to learn it all over because they didn't really teach that at U of T. The, uh, I did quite well. I, I worked hard and uh, I had offers for, uh, for a doctorate's uh, program from four of the top uh, universities in the U.S. at that time. I could have went, but uh, I had got married and I was in debt and uh, I decided I'd uh, take a master's degree if I could do it in one year at U of T and uh, Professor Bill Gross, uh, who uh, was one of the better professors, uh, uh, said that if I put my head down and did a simple thesis and worked like hell, I could do it in a year and that's what I did. So, What did Professor Gross teach? Pardon? What did uh, Professor Gross teach at, at U of T? Uh, Dr. Gross taught economic geology. And we, in later years, would work together to uh, form Locana Mining uh, when he left teaching. Um, so what did you do your master's thesis on? I did my master's degree up at Red Lake, and it was, uh, it was uh, an economic type of degree. It was called uh, Possible Guides to Ore in the Red Lake Camp, and we did geochemistry and some of the batholiths up there and studied cross-folding and structures and uh, I wish I could say I had predicted the uh, the great new finds that came along later in, in Red Lake and they're still developing the uh, some of them, this Bruce Ch Channel deposit that uh, Gold Corp are developing now is, uh, is a, a world beater. It was in the area that I said was, was potential but uh, the, the thesis didn't lead to any uh, any new finds and Falkland Bridge actually uh, um, paid for part of the work, but they never ever did any exploration in, in Red Lake, so I don't know what their interest was. So this is your first job, was it working at, uh, in uh, in mining, working at Red Lake? No, the first uh, job I had in mining, of course, were in in summer jobs. So we we had to. Uh, that I was paying my own way, I, you had to have a good summer job to uh, earn enough funds to pay your tuition. So the first uh, first two years in the summer, uh, uh, Inco at Sudbury used to take on about 600 students and uh, I worked as an underground miner the first year at the Lavac mine uh, outside of Sudbury for about five months. Uh, it was good pay and you got bonus as a as a miner, so it was a very profitable summer. And then the second year, I went back and worked uh, at the Fruit Stobie mine for Inco, uh, right uh, outside Sudbury. So uh, that was my mining experience. And uh, uh, later on in the summertime, I uh, I worked one year with the Geological Survey of Canada doing regional mapping, and that was northwest of Red Lake. Uh, I think that was the hardest summer I. I ever worked. So we were doing regional mapping and uh, we worked from daylight to dark trying to uh, uh, do this regional mapping program. Could you tell us a bit about working as a miner in, uh, with INCO? With uh, INCO, it, it, the, um, the mining methods have all changed now with uh, 
Yeah, in Co at that time at Lavac, they uh, uh, they mainly uh, had uh, stoping where it was called square set stopes, where uh, it was massive sulfide ore, and they had this beautiful BC fir timber that they put in on the stopes and that uh, to keep the ground up. As an old lumberman, I uh, I really uh, felt bad about putting the uh, this timber back underground, and uh, it was very hot work in the stopes and uh, uh, the uh, and, and very high costs. So uh, they worked from essentially the levels were 150 feet apart, feet in those days, and you started at one level and you worked up to the next with square it was called square set stopes. Uh, the summer I worked at Fruit Stoby, uh, it was um, they were mining um, very low grade disseminated ore uh, adjoining the open pit, and it was called Blast Hole. And we uh, loaded up long vertical holes and and blasted in the, with big tonnage into uh, into uh, open cuts. And the grade was. Probably maybe a fifth or a sixth of the grade was at Lavac with the uh, square set stopes. Um, could you tell us about some of the difficulties you faced uh, during your, your mapping work? Are they, is that it was challenging? The master's work? Uh, yeah. yeah. No, it wasn't particular. We had a clear program of what we were trying to do uh, with the masters. We were measuring uh, the uh, of, late stage flows of liquids and in, in magmas that came up trying to see whether the late stages of the magma ore as it flowed to one edge would uh, contain the gold and, and whether you should be looking for gold deposits at the, that edge of the magma and the, uh, the other part was structures cross folding and faults which is pretty normal work in the geological business where you're, you're working in with structures because the they often control ore bodies, and, and the faults often provide the, uh, the channels for the deposits and mineralization to come in on. So it was a fairly straightforward thesis and went well, and uh, I got it done that year and graduated and started full-time employment. And the full-time employment was at? The well, full time that started, uh, I started with the group at that time was called Keeble Mining Group that later evolved into Tech Corporation. And uh, the Keeble Mining Group at that time uh, consisted of a bunch of very junior broke companies headed by Dr. Norman Bell Keeble. And um, uh, he had started a small mine in the park at Tomogamy. Uh, uh, a very high grade small c copper mine and used the profits, a couple million dollar profits from that to piggyback into buying a number of other old companies, uh, Tech Hughes and Pickle Pro and, and Goldfields Uranium, and trying to use their treasuries to explore and, and, uh, and uh, find other mines and do other acquisitions. So I spent about half my time uh, doing exploration work with them in various parts of, of Canada, uh, around Pickle Crow and several years out in BC. And when I wasn't working in the bush in exploration, I was working in the office on acquisitions, trying to acquire new companies. And uh, I did that uh, for about 10 years with them. A couple of the years in the early 60s, I was uh, mainly in British Columbia and I opened their first office there in 1962, a one-man office on West Pender Street. And if you go to their offices there now, four floors in a, a lovely new building, it's, <laughs> it's quite a contrast to the first office we had there in 1962. Could you uh, describe your, your first day of work uh, with Keeble? Uh, for, I don't remember. That's uh, 65 years or... or a long time ago. Now we had uh, we had an, a Norma always thought that uh, it was important to put up a good show when he was trying to get investors to uh, give them money for exploration. So we had an office in the most modern building in downtown Toronto, 
at that time on Adelaide Street, the Board of Trade building. We had the part of the 10th floor in the Board of Trade building. And it, was, uh, it was a very nice office. Uh, later that uh, off building would be renovated uh, twice and then torn down <laughs> as is part of the Bank of Nova Scotia complex now. Mm. So I spent, uh, I spent uh, maybe a week or two in the office that first uh, spring of uh, 59. I was still at the university and then headed up to Pickle Crow to conduct exploration around the uh, Pickle Crow mine in northwestern Ontario, which is uh, a pretty barren, godforsaken place uh, in the area around Pickle Crow. I almost left the business. What, uh, what was especially difficult about, uh, about that area and working there? If you've ever been up around Pickle Crow, it's, uh, it's mainly swamp. And uh, what it in swamp is lakes. The, uh, you'll never believe the black flies and mosquitoes and, uh, uh, until you go up there. Anybody describing to you, you'll think they're exaggerating about 10 times. There's virtually no outcrop to map as a geologist, so we would spend a lot of time just looking for the odd outcrop. And uh, we were doing geophysical work in, in some places where uh, we would uh, try to do a survey to see down through the swamp and overburden whether there's any massive sulfides below it. So uh, the, uh, the living conditions were very tough. We were living in tents and uh, would have to fly in our supplies from uh, from Pickle Lake. And, uh, it was hard keeping crew there. Uh, several of my workers uh, abandoned me during the summer. It's, uh, and we didn't find anything either. It's, uh, so it, it was uh, very tough working conditions. What sort of instrument, instruments did you use in this uh, geophysical work? Well, initially, uh, geophysics has changed an awful lot in the last uh, 50 years in Canada. and, and, and Canada, of course, is, has been a leader for, in, in geophysical techniques uh, very, all around the world now when you see geophysics. It's Canadian geophysics, Canadian companies doing the geophysics. At that time, they, uh, the magnetometer was uh, one of the first instruments that just measured the magne magnetic differences. So if you had a massive sulfide deposit, usually there was some magnetite or puritite in it that would show up as an anomaly, which you sometimes drill. We uh, were doing uh, also a survey called, that Dr. Clark had invented, called long wire geophysics, where you uh, stretched out a, a copper wire over four or five miles and put a generator at one end and put a current into it. And then with uh, an airplane and a receiver would fly back and forth across the wire at hopefully about 400 feet uh, lines, but it was all done off uh, uh, air photo map, so it was a little irregular. So it was quite a job getting this long wire in place and, uh, the, uh, and getting it energized uh, and getting it flown before a moose would get caught in the long wire and, uh, and have it all dragged through the bush. So it would often take a week or more before you could uh, keep the, the long wire in place and get the survey done and, uh, and see whether there were any anomalies. Did, uh, did you make any important discoveries while you were at uh, Keeble Mining Group? Uh, not in that first, uh, first uh, summer, but over the 10 years that uh, I was there, we came up with a number of uh, deposits that uh, we either acquired or, or found. Uh, in uh, in uh, BC, uh, I was the first one. We had the, the Gibraltar Copper Project for a couple of years. It's still being mined in a big way. Uh, we didn't take it uh, into production. In fact, we explored it. And the copper prices were down, and we let it go. And other people, afterwards, uh, when copper prices improved, uh, did more work on it. And Placer Development originally put it into production uh, about ten years later. Um, we um, 
put the, the tri-bag mine, copper mine, in uh, operation in uh, Ontario. And um, in BC, uh, I helped them acquire the high mine, which was a big open pit copper molly. And it's now part of the Valley Copper operation. And uh, we, uh, we also found and, and then acquired uh, the, uh, the uh, Columbia deposit in Quebec that uh, is still in production and was recently sold for some $300 million, I guess, to another company. Um, that's several that come to mind. Uh, could you describe that overall process of discovering a, a find and then and then um, deciding whether to exploit it? And, um, what, it? Like the parts that you were involved in and the parts that you passed on to other people? Yeah, the uh, the process was was much simpler in those days. You could you could come up with a deposit and probably if you decided you wanted to put it into production, which we did at uh, Tribag, a small copper mine. Uh, within about a year, we were closing the, uh, the Pickle Crow mine, and we had some excess machinery and staff, and we just essentially moved it down to the Tribag area and had the mine in, in operation. But uh, other, uh, other deposits uh, take longer, where you have to go underground and uh, the miners take over, the metallurgists take over, they do studies on the recovery and uh, it can often take uh, uh, eight to ten years and uh, nowadays it even takes longer because you have so many different environmental permits you have to get and you have to consult with the native people and you have to consult with the community so the whole process is, uh, is much longer uh, these days. Um, so why and at what point did you move on from the uh, the uh, Keeble Mining Group? Uh, I was there for 10 years and um, I was getting a little bored with what I was doing and there was a number of family members in the, it was, I think, I guess it was called Tech Corporation by that time. They had merged uh, probably eight or nine companies uh, into a bigger group and uh, there was uh, uh, seven or eight family members in the organization at that time, and I could see uh, my uh, uprise moving upwards would be uh, somewhat hindered by my family connections. And uh, in 1970, there were a number of other opportunities around. I was approached by a number of people for various jobs, and my uh, my old professor from U of T days, Bill Gross, who I'd had maintained contact with over the years. Uh, was uh, in the process, he and others were forming some junior companies to explore in, in Mexico and other places and uh, I decided to join up with them and, uh, and help run these junior companies and I would uh, be based in Toronto and, uh, and Bill would go to Mexico and live in Mexico so I left uh, Keeble and joined up with, uh, there were three junior companies, Tormex, Pure Silver and uh, Lacanex that I helped form. And uh, we started exploration work in Canada, the, uh, the Western US, and, uh, and in Mexico. With that time, the big emphasis being on Mexico. Um, could you, so is, this is the Cordex Syndicate? This is the the, uh, the, we formed the Cordex Syndicate at the same time in, in 1970. Uh, one of my companies, Lacanex, was uh, a 25% owner, and the three other companies, Ray Rock, Mobile, and uh, and uh, forgot the other one, were uh, United Cisco, which eventually went into Barrick. Uh, we each put up fifty thousand dollars a year uh, for uh, John Livermore and Pete Galley to explore in, uh, in in Nevada for gold deposits. And Livermore had previously had found the uh, for Dumont, the original Carlin mine, so they had promoted him to his level of incompetency. You know, they made him a president of the Canadian company and an administrator, and he wanted to go to be a prospector. So he left Newmont and uh, went back to Nevada, and we started uh, exploring in a very low way at $200,000 a year uh, in, in Nevada through the Cardex Syndicate. 
And over the years, I guess uh, it was a three-year syndicate. I think there was, uh, by the time I left in 1985, we'd had five or six uh, syndicates with various partners. And it is still running, actually, to the day. Andy Wallace is now running the Cordex Syndicate for, uh, for a company called Columbia Goldfields. It was quite a successful syndicate, but uh, uh, we, uh, uh, on a shoestring type of budget. We came up with over the period of that 15 years, I guess we came up with uh, with uh, all six or seven properties that went into production. So, could you describe your exact role uh, in the syndicate? Well, my role was as president of the Canadian companies. Uh, I just attended syndicate meetings and uh, uh, would go down and visit some of the properties. Uh, I always liked getting out in Nevada because you see lots of rock and. Uh, you could get around very easy, and drilling was cheap. You know, we, we could drill for a dollar a foot down there in the 1970s, so I would go down on a regular basis and have a look at the properties and, uh, and uh, travel around. And, uh, I was part of the management that decided to, you know, how much drilling we were going to do on a project and uh, when we would try to put it into production, that sort of thing. So you traveled a great deal for your work? I traveled a lot for... Uh, work uh, uh, over, the, over the years, yes. I, uh, when I was with Lacana, we had offices uh, in, in across Canada, uh, in Reno, in the United States, and sometimes in Coeur d'Alene, and then in three or four different localities in, in Mexico. So, uh, and later on, I had an oil and gas division in Calgary. So, yes, I was probably... Uh, I was probably in head office about half the time and, and half the time uh, traveling. Did you notice any interesting or important differences in the work culture in Canada, Mexico, uh, different places where you worked? Oh yes, there's, there's a, every, every area and, 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 uh, it has, has, has different rules and regulations and, and problems. Uh, in Canada, Quebec, is usually the best province to work, uh, but conditions change from election to election and local governments. But over the the past 55 odd years, uh, Quebec has usually been the best place to work. They more mining conscious, and they will help you with roads or power plants when you're trying to put something into production. Uh, the other provinces, uh, depending on the government at the time, are. Uh, vary in their wish to have mining in their jurisdiction. In the U.S., there's not very many of the U.S. states that you want to work in. Nevada's one of the best ones, uh, and uh, Arizona and uh, Utah, and maybe Alaska aren't bad, but most of the others, they don't have decent mining laws or they don't want mining. In Mexico, the time when I was active there, it was very difficult to work in Mexico. It's changed now, and there's hundreds of companies down there doing uh, exploration and mining without problems. But at that time, uh, they had a feeling that the mining was part of their main part of their economy, and they didn't want to uh, uh, give control to foreigners. You could only own 49% of a Mexican company. There was all sorts of regulations and uh, had very high taxes. Uh, it, it was. The 15 years I worked in Mexico from uh, 1970 through to 1985 uh, generally were, were very difficult years, fraught with a number of, of, uh, of problems. What, what sort of problems did you have? Just, uh... Well, in, 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 in Mexico, as I mentioned, you, you couldn't really control things too well because you only had a 49% interest. and. Uh, the the tax regime was changing when we in 1980 when we had uh, when we had high gold and silver prices uh, for a couple of years uh, they brought in an excess royalty tax that essentially skimmed off uh, uh, most of the profits uh, on us and another time we always kept our money in the banks down there in U.S. dollars they devalued the peso and seized all the U.S. dollar bank accounts and and just gave us pesos for those at about a third the, the rate. So just in that one, we lost two thirds of our 
our money. And to, it was it was very difficult to, in those days operating in Mexico. We uh, lost control of one of our mines for a year or more. Our general manager had some documents that just, that uh, sort of fake giving giving him ownership of the mine. He took over, came in with some pistoleros and took over control of the mine. And we had a heck of a time getting it back from them through the courts for almost a year. So, so security was more of a challenge in Mexico than elsewhere? That's right, yeah. And it still is to some extent, depending what state you're in. That, uh, Mexico still has a lot of problems now uh, with drug lords and, uh, and there's still the odd robbery of, uh, of the gold operations. It's changed an awful lot. I mean, it's, uh, they don't feel that mining is nearly as critical to their economy then as it uh, it was that time. Well, it's still a very important part of the Mexican economy. Uh, Mexico, I think, is the most highly mineralized country in the world on a square footage basis. So lots of uh, good deposits there. Is uh, security a particular concern when you're working in precious metals? Generally not. Only when, you, uh, when you're doing a gold pour. We uh, uh, would bring the uh, police in for the afternoon or something and uh, then you would um, get the gold bars and, and fly it out or have an armored car take it to a refinery. So uh, when you, when you, the milling operations, when it's uh, just the carbon and pulp or uh, on, uh, coated on zinc, uh, they generally don't go after that. They wait for the gold pour to put some bars to go after. So you still hear you know, probably once a year or so, you'll hear about a, a, a robbery of, of, of a gold mine, but it's it's uh, not too common. Were some of the ores that you work with particularly challenging to, to exploit? Some of the some of the ores that you've worked with. Yeah, some of them. Uh, uh, the deposits are, are are everyone is sort of unique, and uh, they require uh, metallurgical input and testing. That's one of the parts of the feasibility study that we spend a lot of time on taking hopefully uh, representative samples, sending it to labs and testing whether you're going to do it by flotation or acid leaching or uh, gravity recovery. Uh, so there's a number of uh, new methods that have been developed over the last 50 years. And uh, sometimes uh, it's very expensive. Uh, the, the operations uh, you, you have to roast it, and when you do a roaster, you, you, it's very expensive to build, expensive to operate, and uh, it's expensive for environmental uh, reasons. Uh, you have to recover everything that's going up the stack, and that's quite difficult. So, um, and up until I guess 20 years ago, some of these deposits weren't. That you couldn't mine them actually. They, they just sat there until new technologies came along to uh, help recover the metals. So your your peers and friends are they are they mostly geologists and engineers? Yeah, it's it's essentially the people in the business. Uh, as we, we'll talk about maybe a little bit later, the Prospectors and Developers Association. Uh, which I have been involved with for over 50 years, uh, uh, most of those people became lifelong friends and they were essentially in the, uh, in the exploration business. Some of them were prospectors. Um, yeah, the, uh, in this office that, uh, where I rent space, there's 25 uh, uh, engineers, geologists, and metallurgists that uh, I work with. So uh, uh, most of the association Work the parties you have are, are with people in in the business. It's it's uh, a closed shop. It's well known. No matter where you are in the world, you visit a mine, you'll find two or three people there that know you or know your friends. It's uh, uh, the Canadian companies are everywhere in the world, and and they they know each other pretty much. It's uh, often uh, a number of these people lived in mining towns, and the people in mining towns form very close relationships. Uh, the mining town concept is being changed now with fly-in, fly-out operations, but uh, the people in, in mining towns form lifelong relationships. 
What sort of social activities uh, go on in mining towns? How do people bond? And Oh, the mining towns, uh, they, they make their own fun. They always had curling uh, rakes and um, uh, hockey teams and, and softball teams and various social things. Uh, they uh, had a, a very good social life. Uh, uh, in places like Toronto, uh, you're much more dispersed and you don't do as many things together as a group. Uh, the CIM and the PDA and other organizations have mining parties, but uh, you're dispersed and you have so many competing activities, the theaters and Roy Thompson Hall and the Blue Jay uh, <laughs> Stadium there with our team doing well this year. And of course, the, a lot of us were Leaf fans, so we go to the, the Leaf games over the years, so there's a lot more activity in the bigger cities. Some people like the mining towns, and others like the uh, like the big cities. Are there any particular social problems in your line of work uh, in the mining towns? Or? Not that I recall. I never really spent any time uh, living in the mining towns. I was always uh, uh, essentially in the in the big cities for uh, my home. I worked around many of the mining towns, but uh, alcohol is always a problem in in some of the uh, places that. You know, you know the boredom, uh, and especially a problem in the native communities. Uh, but uh, yeah, we did. There was no drugs in my days, so that wasn't wasn't a problem. And uh, it seemed like most of the families were fairly stable. I don't know. I, I don't recall anything in particular. I was uh, my wife stayed with me for 50 years before she died uh, about six years ago. So. Uh, I certainly had a good stable relationship. <laughs> I've heard the, the flying concept has changed uh, a lot of the culture of, of mining and metallurgy and people moving in and out. Yeah, they work on a two week basis now, so uh, you don't have the, 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 the mining towns and the closeness uh, that you uh, that they generated. So now, uh, God, I mean, you, you hear them flying people from Newfoundland up to the tar sands plants and uh, Many of the other places, they they have bunk houses and they they fly in for two weeks and out for two weeks. That sort of concept. So <clears throat> I don't know what is best. They a uh, little big argument there. Of, uh, there's people that say that uh, that long for the the mining town concept, and others saying that they prefer to uh, to live in the cities for two weeks and in mining camps for two weeks. I don't know. I've heard that, well, the advantage is that it, uh, it, you don't have the, when there's a bust in a particular mineral, or you don't have these towns collapsing. Like, you need to try that's, to with that. that's one of the advantages, yes, because uh, once the mines close, and we saw this problem in Timmins and Kirkland Lake uh, years ago when the gold mines were closing down, uh, those communities uh, lost their main source of employment. Uh, so now, uh, if the mine closes down, they just board up the bunkhouses and uh, and the people go elsewhere. So, uh, um, but if you look at a map of Canada, northern Canada, all the towns across the north, essentially were were all mining towns. That's how the uh, the nation was developed, uh, and uh, it's not their permanent towns now. Uh, so you're not going to have that same uh, process in the future because uh, these areas are just going to be closed up and abandoned. Places like Elliott Lake uh, that once supported uh, 11 uranium mines, if you go up there now it's a retirement community, it's beautiful. You'd, a little sad in some ways, you wander around and you'd never know there was a mine there. The, everything's been taken down and restored, the tailings, ponds, now are lakes and there's ducks swimming around. And, Last time I was up there, there were some deer grazing in a field that was a, a tailings pond. So it's a very nice retirement community. So your main professional organization is the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada, is that right? Yes, I spent. Uh, I got. I got uh, involved with them very early in my career. One of my jobs in the early days with the Kivo Mining Group, uh, which later became Tech Corporation, was. Um, grub staking 
prospectors. Uh, rep staking is a, is a concept, an idea that's gone by the boards now, but in the uh, uh, 40s and 50s and 60s, uh, prospecting was very common and there was a lot of prospectors around and uh, they would come around and ask individuals and companies for a grub stake. They would be raising anywhere from ten to thirty thousand dollars for a summer's exploration program and they would come in and see us and I would uh, often give them five hundred or a thousand dollars for a small piece of their grub stake. So, um, and I probably with the Keeble Group handled maybe 20 rub stakes a year. And all these prospectors were part of the Prospectors and Developers Association. At that time, you had to be, to be a director of the PDA, you had to be a prospector. That would change later on. So I got to know these people and uh, they didn't like writing reports or briefs and many of them couldn't do it. So they knew me and, and started asking whether I would be a help them if they were doing a brief to the Securities Commission or the Tax Department on these matters. So very early on I, I started uh, helping on briefs and um, the association had a difficult period in the mid-sixties when Mrs. McMillan had to leave. And I helped the, them restore the association the next year and then finally I, um, I went on the board in 1970 of the uh, Prospectors and Developers Association and I was the first engineer per se to be a director and um, I helped run the convention that we have in Toronto every year and, uh, and then in 1975 uh, uh, Jim Walker and I went in, I was in, went in as vice president and Jim was president and he was a geophysical contractor and gone a large part of the year so essentially I was running the association during the two years he was president and then I became president myself in 77 and uh, we uh, we expanded the board uh, uh, to 48 members and uh, it had been anywhere between 12 and 30 it seemed to vary how many directors they had and they didn't really have any routine for a regular directors meeting. We decided that we would uh, we would go across Canada and we talk people into going on the board to represent the industry across Canada and uh, we would have a meeting every month at the same date so that people could come to Toronto they knew that the second Tuesday of a month that we're going to be a PDA board meeting and they could do other business visit relatives or raise money or talk to an engineering firm. So we changed the association uh, big time and made it uh, you know, representative across Canada and uh, regular board meetings and formed uh, uh, quite a few new committees that would work on land regulations or taxation, securities commission, uh, all these issues that we ended up with about 12 different committees. And uh, I've been involved in it ever since. Uh, I started the awards committee uh, with them in 78 with one award, the Bill Dennis Canadian Discovery of the Year. And I'm still chair of that awards committee uh, now and we're just meeting now. So we have uh, six or seven awards we give out every year. That, uh, awards night on the Monday night we acknowledge people's contribution to the industry. So uh, yeah, I uh, over 50 odd years uh, I've been involved with them on just about every committee uh, and uh, they're, um, you know, many of the people are lifelong friends. Excuse me, what's, what's the distinction between a prospector and, uh, and a geological engineer? The geological engineer is an educated prospector, really. Uh, the prospector sometimes knows a little more than the geological engineer to start with, but uh, uh, they can teach each other a few things. Uh, in the early days, you know, I found it always wise to listen to the, my prospectors, what they were uh, telling me about. Uh, it's theory and practice, really. Uh, and depending on what school you come from, you're, you, you might be a good prospecting type uh, 
geological engineer, if you're not too th theoretical. It's, uh, so. But uh, there are very few prospectors left now. It's, uh, there's, there's a few, but, uh, and a lot of these people are fairly well educated now. Mm. They, they've gone to the Hale Valley School of Mines, or some of them have geological degrees, but they, they still do, do prospecting. So at some point there was a great deal of folk knowledge and experience involved in, in, in prospecting and finding deposits? Yeah, yeah, especially if there's, if there's outcrop where you can see the, uh, the rock and the alteration. And uh, uh, in Canada and places, uh, you know, you have to rely on geophysics and drilling and there's just no outcrop to go by. But in other places in the world, in Mexico and a lot of Latin America, Africa, where the rocks are visible, and you can see alteration and veining and things like that. That the, uh, the locals sometimes um, have a pretty good understanding of what's uh, what's valuable and what isn't. <laughs> so. Is there a, a real interest in history in, uh, within uh, your association? Um, yeah, to some extent. In uh, in 1982, uh, uh, we. Um, was our 50th anniversary of the PDA, and I was a past president. And uh, at a board meeting, uh, we were talking about what we could do for our 50-year anniversary, 50th anniversary. And uh, I chirped up that, oh, maybe we should put a book together. And uh, everybody thought, yeah, that was a good idea, but they were all busy. Who was going to do it? And I uh, knew George Lawn, who was a, a very well-known artist and book man, and I said, well, I'll ask George to see whether he would do it, and they gave me a budget, and I went to see George, and uh, he was very busy doing portrait painting at that time, and uh, wasn't too interested in uh, doing a book, but he said, uh, uh, I'll lend you my uh, my assistant here, Ed, and you know, why don't you head it up and, and do it, and uh, Monica's quite good at putting things together, so I got stuck with doing the book. So I contacted uh, uh, 30 or 40 people across Canada to do a write-up in their mining camp. And uh, Frank Jubin was, uh, at that time, was very friendly with Viola McMillan, who had been the previous, you know, lady that ran the association and had her records. So Frank offered to go through her records to put things together. So I put together a book called The Discoverers for the first 50 years of the PDA. And I still have copies around. To, and it was stories of the mining camps across Canada. And uh, probably 30 or 35 mining personalities at the time, a brief uh, biography on them. So we, uh, yeah, that was a good uh, historical uh, moment that, uh, that brought together a lot of facts about mining camps. Uh, Flynn Flon to be straight across Canada. And uh, for the 75th, uh, I was involved again, and we, we did another similar book for the 75th anniversary of the, uh, of the, uh, the PDA. So Northern Miner did most of that. I certainly learned my lesson by that time and just advised on it. Too. So they have, uh, they have certain memorabilia, but the the problem the problem in nowadays is that uh, the space uh, we've lost most of the mining companies the bigger mining companies at one time had vast libraries downtown nobody wants a library anymore there's not a good mining library uh, downtown uh, in Toronto anymore so uh, yeah our history is escaping us so it's good that uh, we're putting the, together something here uh, the with the uh, with the metallurgical group. Uh, myself, I recently, uh, well, recently, about 20 years ago, I started to uh, put together some of my uh, history and my family's history. I decided that uh, I didn't know anything really much about my ancestors and my grandchildren would know less. So I, I started writing a book about my family and my history. So that was about 20 years ago and it's going to be published uh, probably next week, uh, just on a private basis while I'm doing it for the family and everything. And it's called A Boy from Utterson, which was a little town where I grew up north of uh, north of Bracebridge. So in that I've included 
my mining experiences over the uh, 50 odd years and I've also included a brief uh, history of the uh, Prospectors and Developers Association and a brief history of the Mining Hall of Fame which I helped start uh, some 28 years ago with Mort Brown and a few other people but, uh, and it's quite successful and it's, uh, you know, it's gone electronic with uh, we're trying to get we're trying to get the exhibits and museums all across Canada we have a big exhibit up at the ROM and, and a few other places. Tell us more about your involvement uh, in founding the uh, Mining Hall of Fame. Well, uh, Mort and I had, had both gone to the, the Mining Hall of Fame in the U.S. They have well, they have two Mining Hall of Fames in the U.S. actually. <coughs> Mort was the publisher of the Northern Miner for many, many years and sort of the uh, the dean of, uh, of the liter literary world here and mining stories and and uh, Mort went down to uh, one of the mining hall of fames and he came back and he uh, he gave me a call and he said he had quite a distinctive voice and he said Ed I think we should have a Canadian mining hall of fame and I said I think so Mort I agree uh, I've been thinking the same and he said do you think the PDA would go along and help support it? And I said, I'm sure they would, Mort. Let's get a couple other organizations and see what we can do. Well, it was hard to say no to Mort. He was very uh, effusive and well liked, and uh, so uh, he got a hold of Pat Sheridan and Leon La Prairie, who were quite well known mining people, and uh, and we talked to some others and uh, and. Uh, we just got it going. The uh, the uh, it was tough sledding for the first few years getting people to come out. We decided to have it for the uh, the function in early January, uh, and uh, we put uh, I think twelve people in the first year that were famous. And of course, he had a, a, a vast backlog of people when you you start. We started in '88, I think it was. So. Uh, it's just gone from strength to strength. Have you ever been to the Mining Hall of Fame dinner? Yeah. Should go sometime. We have. We get usually about 825 people now at the Royal York, and Pierre Lassand uh, has been our MC uh, person for the last number of years. And uh, we first uh, had a home up at the mining building at U of T, and uh, then uh, we moved up to the ROM in with the tech suite of minerals at the back of the ROM for our exhibit and uh, we've been trying to get exhibits across the country in mining museums on the Mining Hall of Fame so it's uh, we normally put in four to five people every year uh, I'm still on the board and the treasurer of the organization and chairman of the awards committee so I'm still very much involved but we have a rule that you go off when you turn 80, and I'll turn 80 uh, next August, so I'll be saying adieu to my, one of my babies. So it's sort of sad, but it's been very successful, and, uh, and uh, it keeps a record of some of the achievements of the various people, and it's available uh, if we keep working at it across Canada in the museums when the kids go in to, to see the mineral exhibits at the back of it or some part of it will be the electronic uh, mining hall of fame people where they can look up people here and there and what they did and what metals they were associated with and, and normally we have a also uh, a section on the importance what each copper is used for gold platinum things like that can you describe your current work as a mining consultant uh actually i i really don't work as a mining consultant i uh, when I went on my own, I, uh, I formed my company, E.G. Thompson Mining Consultants, Inc., but essentially I, uh, I did a little bit of consulting on acquisitions and takeovers, but mainly I went on various boards, and I, um, I ran junior companies out of this office. I, for many years, I'd have two or three junior companies that I was either president of or chairman of, and, and uh, help keep them alive and did a little expiration work uh, and uh, ran them on a minimum budget. I could keep a company going uh, for, and I did for many years uh, with an overhead of $50,000. Uh, 
you talk to anybody now and they'll say anywhere from 250 to 350 uh, under thousand you know to, for overhead for a junior company so essentially that's what I uh, I did for close to 25 years with the, and uh, in my heyday around the 2000 I, I was uh, a director or president or chairman of uh, some 15 different junior companies that were involved in various parts of the world so yeah we were talking about junior companies yeah so uh, uh, I was I've been involved with junior companies uh, all my career I guess when I was with tech we had 15 or 20 junior companies and then Lacana started with uh, three junior companies which I rolled into Lacana mining in 75 and then after I left uh, Monarco in 91 I uh, spent the rest of my career really with with junior companies and it, it was quite interesting they uh, you have to be a jack of all trades with a junior company. You, uh, you know, you one or two people run junior companies, so uh, you uh, decide on the expiration plays and who's going to drill what and, uh, and how you raise money. You, you spend more time raising money than you do spending money with with junior companies. So a lot of the companies were very successful. Uh, uh, I don't know whether you want to talk about them now, but uh, it's. Uh, some of the big successes was the, the, we had was consolidated Thompson. We had the uh, iron property in Quebec. I, uh, it was an old company that I took over in '91 and kept going. Uh, finally, uh, got a group to put it into production, and uh, it went into production at uh, five million tons of uh, iron ore per year. And Cliffs took the company over a few years ago for 4.9 billion dollars. And for many years, it was on the Toronto Stock Exchange for a few hundred thousand dollars. Stock was five cents, and Cliffs took it over at fourteen ninety-five, I think it was. Uh, another company I was involved with uh, for many years, is probably twenty years, as a director, or uh, uh, I was president for about three years and chairman for another ten. Was Golden Queen Mining and. In a month or two's time, it will go into production in Northern California as a, a big heat bleach cold operation. So, uh, uh, California is a very tough place to work. So, uh, it, any any other place, it probably would have been in production 15 years ago. We've just gone through permitting and delays. And Pretty strict environmental reasons. Oh yeah, and they generally they they, uh, they don't want mining. It's uh, so they make you jump through hoops, and, and it's not a it's not a barn burner of a of a mine. It's everything has to be go right, it's low grade, and it's going to be heat bleaching. But uh, looks like it'll be in production finally. So I went on that board in the mid '90s and kept it alive out of this office for about three years in uh, 2000 to 2002, and then I was able to bring a president in to look after it and I stayed on as chairman until about a year and a half ago and uh, the operators have put it into production. So uh, I'll mention one other, there, there's uh, probably been uh, you know 15 or 20 mines from the junior companies that I was involved with. But the other big one that's just going into production right now is the Petakia project in Panama that uh, we originally had in a company called Adrian Resources. Uh, Tech did a lot of work on it, spent $20 million doing a feasibility study and dropped it with low copper prices. And uh, InMet decided a few years ago they were gonna put it in production. When Tech was doing, we thought it would cost a billion dollars. When InMet started, it was gonna be four and a half billion. And I think it's up to six billion, but uh, First Quantum took over InMet and I think it will be in production you know, in the next few months as well. Major, major uh, 100,000 ton a day copper project in Panama. So those were the type of projects that these junior companies brought along. The, uh, the junior companies are very important in the business to bring projects to a certain, certain stage and, and then usually they have to turn them over to the majors to develop. It's, over your career, have you uh, collaborated with uh, geophysicists at the university? No, I don't really work with the universities in that way. Uh, 
the the only collaboration that I had with the universities uh, was with Bill Gross on economic geology, and for a number of years, probably about most of the time, I was with Tech. We would um, we would sponsor uh, thesis work uh, at the university on our minds, and so uh, Gross would. Uh, uh, generate a thesis that a student would work on uh, at one of our mining operations. So we would fund that student for doing that. Uh, but I uh, didn't really have much uh, involvement with the with the geophysical work uh, part of it. Though our our company at that time, Tech uh, Norm Keevil, Doctor Senior, was a geophysicist and. Norm Jr. graduated with me in geology, then he went to Berkeley and worked mainly in geophysics. And the tech group were always very heavy in geophysics. They, they developed a, a, a very famous uh, DIGEM airborne system. It took them 10 years and millions of dollars to develop that. So uh, the Kibo group uh, did a lot of geophysical work. Has the technology changed a great deal over your career? Oh yes, yeah. Uh, well, you know, we got we're talking about fifty years, so the uh, it's amazing. Everything, the space work, you know, helped all industries with the miniaturization of things. The the magnetometers that we had to use originally, that you know, you had to set them up on a tripod, tripod, and level them up and take background readings. And now you have a little machine around your neck. You just walk and press a button and it. It, it takes a reading and records it to all, and then and later on you can draft that out. It'll draft out the map on the anomaly. So the uh, it's the, the the and the sensitivity is is uh, has changed so much both in in geophysics and geochemistry. Uh, one of our problems now in the, from the geochemical side is that we can measure down to one part per trillion, and the general public doesn't always realize that if you say there's a one part per trillion uh, arsenic or something in the water that it's uh, you know you need about 10 or 15 parts per million to be dangerous but they you know they they grab onto some of these numbers and they have no idea what is significant and what isn't have uh, women uh, been present in your career uh, in, in your field has that changed over time yeah, it's changed a heck of a lot over time. Uh, in my early career uh, at uh, engineering at the University of Toronto, I think we had three women in the 600 odd engineers that started. And uh, I don't think they lasted past the first year, so essentially nobody graduated. Uh, when I worked with tech, we, uh, we always seemed to have at least one woman geologist. We had one at, at the uh, up at Tomogamy, uh, and the, with Lacana, I, I guess I had one. Uh, but uh, you know, in this office here, where there's maybe four or five women uh, engineers, uh, but uh, they've only really started coming into the business in the last ten, in the last decade or so. If you go up to the university now in the Lausanne Mining Program at UT, I think probably more than half of the, the students there are women now. So uh, it's a tough business, though. It's it's uh, you know especially if you're doing field work, uh, it's a tough existence. Uh, but uh, a lot easier than than it was. <laughs> the camps are much more friendly and easier to live in than they were in my day. What are some of the biggest challenges that you face over your career? Oh God, they come in various shapes and sizes. Uh, from uh, you know, when when I started, the, one of the challenges, of course, was just just existing. You were you were put into these places, uh, uh, remote areas, with uh, often no communication. Sometimes you had a radio that might work or might not, and uh, we're told that two weeks time you might see a supply plane, or you sometimes had to travel a distance to where you were going to meet the supply train. So, uh, uh, plane, and uh, so it was. It was a tough existence. If you had problems, I was very lucky that in one way that uh, I had my appendix out in the summer, of spring of '58, before going into the bush with the GSC, 
And if I hadn't, I would have been dead because uh, with the GSC mapping, we only we had no radio, and we only saw a supply plane every two weeks. And we had to move from one. We spent two weeks mapping and traveling, so in two weeks' time, we had to be at a spot where the supply plane would meet us with two weeks more food. So uh, any accident or anything, you uh, you you didn't have any way of communicating. So uh, that was a challenge. Uh, the uh, there was all sorts of challenges in trying to get permission to explore and to mine, and they've just increased up over the years. Uh, um, the uh, now you have to consult with. The natives, communities, and it can sometimes take a couple of years before you're allowed to go in and explore. And if you're running a junior company, you can't you can't exist that way because the market wants wants news. People buy stock; they expect you're going to do something right away. And if you're delayed a year or two, they forget you and they move on to somebody else. Um, in Mexico, we've just talked about oh, some of the challenges there, which are were uh, really tough in the 60s and 70s with government and uh, with changing tax laws and, uh, and currency problems. The, uh, the biggest disappointment challenge that I guess I faced in, in Canada was the uh, Blizzard Uranium project in BC, which myself and uh, my fellow geologist Daryl Johnson discovered in, uh, in 1977. And we brought. We didn't have any money in the company. We were broke, so we brought in partners, Ontario Hydro, and and uh, an oil company, and and um, a couple other companies to help develop it. And we uh, we developed a, a mineable deposit lying close to the surface. Uh, did a feasibility study, and I and one of the other partners flew over to Korea and negotiated a sale contract with Koreans for. $42 a pound plus escalation, and it looked like it was going to go in a simple mine, simple operation. We would put it into production, the tailings pond, any leakage, one part per million, and the deposit was currently leaking 30 parts per million from both ends of it because it was on the surface. And we were all set to go on it, and everybody was going to make money, and it was going to be a success for Lacana in uh, in Canada. And the government of BC, uh, Wacky Bennett Jr., uh, brought in a moratorium: no mining or mineral exploration for uranium in BC. So uh, it was in the Kelowna area, where there were a lot of hippies and and retired people, and they just didn't want uranium in their backyard, a lot of misconceptions about uranium, as there still is. Uh, we had public meetings and uh, you'd get people standing up and crying saying that, oh, they're going to uncover this uranium and a radon cloud is going to come down the, the valley and uh, we're all going to have cancer. One lady said, I'm pregnant and I'm, I'm afraid my baby's going to have two heads. And, you know, that sort of uh, comment, which... Uh, you, you know, the politicians listened, and uh, the deposit is still sitting there, and it's still eroding into the environment. And uh, I guess I don't know. I guess it will ever. I guess it will be mine sometime, maybe a hundred years from now. But uh, so there's that sort of problem, and uh, and it's not unique. I mean, the, the mining industry is faced with that sort of opposition everywhere, and, and any development project, be it pipeline or or a mine, uh, they're, they're faced with these problems nowadays. I'm glad I'm not a young man starting out in the business anymore. It occurs to me that I should have asked you about your work with the Geological Survey. Uh, you want to talk about that briefly? Or no? oh, well, it was just the summer work. Uh, they, uh, 1958 was a depression year, and the government decided they would uh, help out a bit, and then they added a a few new mapping programs. They had areas they wanted to map, so we were uh, a, a tag-on uh, program that was formed at the last minute. Uh, the only guy that had much experience or any experience in doing that sort of mapping was Ned Chowan, who was uh, later went on to a fairly famous career with the uh, 
Quebec Department of Mines and the GSC. And uh, another guy and I that were senior mappers, we were geological students, but we really didn't have any mapping experience, and our assistants were, weren't even ge geological students. So uh, we were thrown together at the last minute with there were any old supplies that uh, the GSC had, 17-foot uh, prospector canoes, and uh, went up to Red Lake and started mapping to the northwest of Red Lake. And uh, regional mapping, which meant when you did a, a, a survey, you had to cover eight to nine miles a day in the, in the bush, which was very difficult to do because it was burnt over jack pine and you were just working off air photos. And then when you moved camp, which we did every two or three days, you had to, you were supposed to map the shoreline from a canoe when you are moving camp along rivers and lakes. And that is very difficult when you have a fully loaded 17-foot canoe with all your worldly possessions and camp and food on some of these windy lakes trying to go along the shore and mm -hmm. decide what the, the rock type was. So. Um, very challenging summer. Um, when I, uh, about 10 years ago, when I was first starting to write my book, I contacted Ned Chown about it and asked to send me a copy of the map he compiled. And uh, he, he said uh, that that was one of the most challenging summers of his career as well. But that uh, he found out later that we were the only group that had done our work on time and budget that summer of the GSC program, so Excellent. I don't know whether that was right or not, but uh, he stayed on with the GSC for a number of years, so I guess he had access to that information. What's uh, your fondest memory that relates to your work? Well, generally the, 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 biggest, the biggest high is going to mine openings. Uh, you see the result of years of work and planning and sometimes you might have been involved with the project for uh, for five or ten years other times <coughs> you were just casually involved with it maybe for a year or two but you got to go to the mine opening and have a drink and see them make the first gold pour so i always found that as a hide as to see that the actual head frame or the open pit and the wheels turning around and for precious metal mines, they always do a gold pour for you. Which, you know, you see the gold pouring down into the bars, and then they, they show it, and they have a few armed guards around usually. So the uh, the, uh, the mine openings are uh, uh, one of the, the great memories, uh, and I, I guess maybe I've been to twenty of them over the over the years. Uh, uh, some that I was very close to, and others that I was just sort of a almost a bystander too. Uh, yeah, some of the other things of course is, is, is the PDA, our achievements at the Prospectors and Developers Association. We've had a great time there, uh, a lot of great parties and we've done a lot of good things. We we influence legislation on, on, on mining laws and taxation and the Securities Committee work. Uh, and uh, well, we were you know, we were really responsible for bringing in flow-through funding, which has saved the Canadian mining industry and, and allowed the Canadian mining industry to have a base in Canada, which they went all over the world. Sir, what is flow-through funding? Hey? What is flow-through funding? Flow-through funding is a tax mechanism where if you buy a flow-through share from a junior company, they spend it on expiration and you get the tax write-off not the company. So the gen generally the company, the junior company spending money, uh, they don't have any income for, you know, sometimes never have any income. So uh, they never get a write-off for their expenses. If you're a major company and you're in production and you spend a dollar in expiration, you write that off your taxable income. So flow-through funding lets the public write it off against its income. If you have $100,000 of income, you might um, buy ten thousand dollars of a flow-through share, and you, you get that deducted from you, your income. Of course, your flow-through share that you have has a zero cost base, so that if you sell it, then that's capital gains. But it's very popular, and uh, we got it going in a big way in the uh, early '80s, 
and um, the junior companies uh, raised uh, the peak, I guess, uh, about nine hundred million dollars a year in exploration funding to to uh, you know find new mines, and there's a lot of new mines developed because of flow through funding. So that's something that we have pushed, and every year we have to keep on the government to maintain it because they they decide every year whether they're going to continue it. Mm -hmm. The legislation has to come in. Whether the, if you read some of their promises. They, they sometimes mention flow through funding. They'll extend flow through funding for a year. So that was a. It was important because it allowed the companies to have, and the money had to be spent in Canada. So it allowed the companies to have a geological base in Canada, and then if they raised other money, they could go other places in the world. So uh, you know, in the in the decade time after 2000, the Canadian companies. When I was young uh, in business, there was four or five countries in the world you wanted to explore. Now the Canadian companies are probably in a hundred different countries in the world. If you go to the PDA convention, we have anywhere from 100 to 110 different countries come into our PDAC convention in March here in Toronto. Mm. And uh, we've been running between 25 and 30,000 people at this convention now. Anytime you can convince 25,000 people to come to Toronto in early March, you know they're not coming in for the weather mm -hmm. or the, the beaches are a good time. You, you're doing something right. <laughs> what do you feel the government's role should be in promoting uh, mining and prospecting? Promoting mining? And, and prospecting, promoting that. Well, the big thing they've done is to, uh, is in Canada, is, is flow through funding. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the overall you know, if you're looking at various governments around the world, and you have to realize that in Canada, uh, exploration and mining is a provincial matter. So every province has their own rules and regulations, and the federal government just has an, an overall view in, on taxation. So the 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 overall uh, reaching uh, necessities, you have to have stability stability in your regulations and your tax laws because there's such a long time frame in mining you start prospecting and it might take you in eight or ten years you might never find a good property but then once you found one then the feasibility study it might be another eight or ten years so it's, it's not unusual for a mine coming into production to spend a 20-year time span so you, ne you need to know what the regulations are, are for that period of time for people to put up money to keep it going. If you don't have good regulations, uh, people aren't going to give you money to uh, continue. So the uh, stability uh, of funding and, and, uh, and accessibility to the land, you have to be able to get in to explore. Uh, if there's too much private land or if you, if you turn too much of the land into parks, you can't explore in parks. Uh, so our problem now worldwide, and especially in Canada, is so much land is being withdrawn in parks or sensitive areas or native reserves. Or uh, uh, so our, our our base for explorers is is shrinking all the time. But there's there's a role for government uh, in that, and they they just have to uh, give us give us the tools to you know make it attractive tax-wise and we always say we need access to the land and access to capital. We have to have capital markets to, uh, to raise money. What do you believe is your uh, biggest accomplishment uh, in the world of, of mining? <laughs> I don't know whether I've had a great accomplishment and we've mentioned a number of the, of the uh, mines that uh, I had some involvement in over the years. Uh, um, Bringing a mine into production is the end result of a lot of people's contribution. You know, it's not one person, it's teams of people that do it. Uh, so I've been lucky to have been involved in probably 20 different mining operations that have come into place. But uh, I like that, I, I take particular pride in the, in the associations that I was involved with, the, uh, the PDAC, which I spent 50 years uh, um, running and, uh, and uh, working on committees and 
being active and doing a lot of things. Uh, uh, the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame, which is, you know, very uh, well funded and, and great organization now with uh, with uh, showing what Canadian people have done in the mining sector, making it available in museums. And uh, I've also been very much involved in what we call Mining Matters, which is an education program that uh, the PDAC started uh, many years ago, runs now as a separate organization. And we, uh, we go into schools uh, in grades four and grade seven with a program that teaches kids about minerals and the, the value of metals. And, you know, they don't realize when they pick up their cell phone or their computer that somebody had to mine 16 or 18 different metals to, to make the thing run. And that, you know, we have a saying in the business, if it can't be grown, it has to be mined. So we, we try to point out to them all the things that they, uh, that they use comes from mining. Mm. Because a lot of the teachers have no in, in information like that either. They're, they're, a lot of them are anti-mining. So after they've gone through our program, they're much better off. So we do that uh, uh, in uh, various provinces, and uh, I, I'm a director of Mining Matters, and I'm one of their fundraisers, because uh, we have to raise money every year to keep it going. And uh, it's uh, it's a worthwhile worthwhile program. We the other part of that is that. Uh, we go into uh, various native communities across the north, and uh, often mining companies that are working in that area will support us, and we have a program to teach the native children about uh, mining and the job opportunities of mining. And that, that's quite a popular uh, area. So, yeah, and that's uh, they're, they're, they're worthwhile causes. I very happy with that. And that's what I'm still doing now. I'm not consulting or doing anything. I just do volunteer work now. What are some of the important contributions that Canadian engineers and uh, geologists have made to the field? If you could name, say, three. Oh, God, I mean, the, you know, after hockey, mining and mineral exploration is the thing we do best. You go anywhere in the world in a mine or an exploration project, and you'll see Canadian engineers, geologists, uh, metallurgists uh, on these projects. And often they found them, they develop them, and they're they're running them with a few people. Usually, the, you know, there might be a couple of thousand people there, so the, there may be only half a dozen expats there now. But they were responsible for bringing them along, and uh, these areas, no matter where you are. The people that are working in mining are a lot better off than anybody else in that general area. And that's one of our problems is that sometimes they're paid too well and they, they disturb the, uh, the balance of the economics. of the, the farmers don't like us because they pay very low wages to their workers. And mm -hmm. you develop a mine, uh, a mine worker will probably make, you know, maybe three times what he'd make working as, as, uh, as a farmer. So we've, uh, we've led the, the world pretty much in mining, and especially in geophysics. Uh, it's, it's all essentially Canadian geophysics now that's done. Mm -hmm. And uh, in metallurgy, uh, most of the processes, I think, have, have mainly been, if they haven't been developed, they've been fine-tuned by Canadian metallurgists. You go anywhere in the world, these operations, like metallurgists in this office, at any one time, they may be in... South America or Kazakhstan or something, their demand to go to go to consult. <coughs> so just a few closing questions. Who would you say was your greatest mentor um, or had the greatest impact in your professional career? I don't know. Probably probably Bill Gross, who I had the, the I did both my thesis, my bachelor's and my master's with Bill at U of T, and then we uh, uh, we, we were together in some business deals before I joined him with the uh, bunch of junior companies that uh, Pure Silver, Tarmax, and Lacanex that I eventually ran into, uh, moved into Lacana. So we worked together there for uh, about 15 years. Uh, he, was, he was a good promoter and a uh, and, uh, difficult guy to work with at times. 
but uh, we had a lot of fun together, did some good things together. Uh, Dr. Keeble Sr., in one way, I didn't work closely with him, but he was always enthusiastic and uh, uh, every, anything, nothing, anything was possible with him. He never, never said, no, you can't do that. He'd give you free reign and, uh, and uh, if you ever suggested an idea to him, you better be sure that you wanted to do it because he was always gung-ho to proceed. You know, you were never a naysayer. <laughs> What are the most important lessons that you've learned? Well, yeah, that's a good question. When I started, when I started on my own uh, with junior companies after I, uh, in 1991, I, I thought about various things, and uh, the one, the one item that I came up with that sort of directed me when people asked me to go on boards or get involved in. A project or, or do things with them, either in a syndicate or something. I uh, I had a list of six or seven uh, criteria that I went through, and the top one was be only associated with people that you know, like, and trust. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found that worked quite well. Everything else sort of fell away from that because in junior companies, you can't <coughs> you can't really have too many safety. Uh, checks and balances. You, you, people have to be able to go ahead and make decisions and move on. And uh, if you trusted people, then you, when you were away, they did certain things and you didn't worry that they were uh, uh, doing something that was illegal or incorrect. Uh, so that worked well. And in the, uh, generally in the, in the mineral business, uh, We've got a great group of people. I've enjoyed most of them. There's the odd bad apple, but generally they've been a heck of a good group to work with. Uh, lifelong friendships, and uh, I value friendships. I work at maintaining friendships, and uh, and uh, it's uh, certainly enriched my life. Uh, Is there anything else that you'd like to add before I finish? No, I, I mentioned to you earlier that I've written a book so that there's going to be a written history of my activities that will be available. I don't know whether they're in your archives you've got any place for, for books or things like that, but I'd be happy to uh, donate a book to the archives that cover my history uh, uh, with their space that's going to be published, I guess, in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah, we'll mention that to That's up. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. My pleasure. I think it's uh, a good effort to uh, to uh, get uh, our history put down. There's uh, the number of people who are doing it now in these days. The number of companies have, uh, have put together books over the years. and I've read a number of them. I always find them very interesting. Mm -hmm. and I wish there was some central place where we, we could uh, put all our archives, the books and mm -hmm. things like that. So we have some space at the Prospectors and Developers Association, where I've uh, accumulated some things, but uh, there never seems to be enough space for for archives. That's true. Thank you. Okay. Very good.